Mr. Axel and Bois, thank you so much for your time, for giving us uh, these useful insights. And first, we'd like to know what is your definition of such broad terms as accessibility and disability. So please tell us about that. Absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, disability is now very well defined uh, in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And disability is defined as the result of the interaction between a type of impairment that you may have, mm. be it sensorial, physical, or sometimes cognitive uh, disability or cognitive impairment, mm. and the inability of your environment to actually cope with it. In other terms, the inability of the environment uh, you live in mm. to actually bring you the solution for you to actually operate as anybody else. Mm. So the, the disability, uh, as defined by, by the convention, is really the, the result of, a, of an impairment, but also the responsibility of society. Mm -hmm. So practically, what does that mean? Uh, you have persons with disabilities who uh, may actually be very visible to you. For example, someone in a wheelchair with uh, physical impairments mm -hmm. or limitations for mobility li uh, limitations. Uh, you may have persons who have a hard time to move their hands or mm -hmm. uh, have some kind of very obvious uh, type of limitations. But uh, on the other hand, you have lots of uh, impairments which are not visible and sometimes are not even known by the people. For mm -hmm. example, uh, two main categories that are most likely to be non-identified uh, even in schools mm -hmm. are hard of hearing impairments mm -hmm. and cognitive disabilities such as you know learning disabilities or uh, you know inability to speech at a normal pace mm -hmm. or inability to comprehend text or dyslexia or any of those impairments. Mm -hmm. So uh, disabilities include a lot of different conditions and different situations and a lot of different interaction between individuals and their environment, mm. uh, we count today uh, about 10% of the world population uh, as the population that lives with lifelong disabilities. Mm. Uh, if you actually, when you do the census, ask the right question, mm. you find actually many more people than what you think. So in other terms, if you ask someone who has a macular degeneration, mm. uh, who has lost central vision, for example, are you blind? Mm. No, I am not blind. You know, I, can, I can get around. I can go on the street. I can mm -hmm. go shopping yeah. uh, with some difficulties, but I'm okay. Yeah. But technically, that person cannot use a phone or a computer mm. because of the lack of central vision. Mm. So the way you ask the question when you do the census about trying to identify how many persons live with disabilities yeah. is crucial. If you ask a person, are you disabled? The likelihood person is going to say no. Mm. I am not disabled. Mm -hmm. Unless they are really very visibly disabled. Mm -hmm. So if you ask the question that way, you actually lose 75% of the population mm -hmm. in terms of identification. Mm -hmm. So what does accessibility mean? If we defined already disability, how can we define accessibility? Sure. Well, accessibility is uh, a very important uh, concept in that it means that as an individual living with a certain type of impairment, mm -hmm. Uh, you have full access to your environment on an equal basis with other people. Mm. So, for example, in traditional terms, accessibility to the physical environment was the ability for someone in a wheelchair mm -hmm. to access a building with a ramp, mm -hmm. possibly having a door that's large enough to accommodate the wheelchair, and have any type of uh, rooms or equipment or doorways or toilets in the building mm. to be compatible with the wheelchair. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, the same would apply, for example, for transportation, mm -hmm. where accessible transportation would mean that you have the means for a person with disabilities to actually access a car, a van, a train, or a plane. Yeah. Right? Now, in the Convention on the Rights for, for, for Persons with Disabilities, mm. uh, the notion of accessibility has been expanded mm. dramatically by defining accessibility as access to the physical environment, to the to the tra to transportation, and to information and connection mm -hmm. technologies mm -hmm. and new media. Yeah. That means today it is as important from a legal standpoint, an ethical standpoint, a mm. human rights standpoint, to actually design an accessible website mm. than it is to design a building with a ramp mm. and accessible features. Yeah. Same level of obligation. Mm. So what that means for all persons living with disabilities mm. is the ability to live a normal life yeah. without any disadvantage versus other persons. Mm and uh, reach their full potential in their you know, personal development, professional career, mm -hmm. education, uh, political activities, mm -hmm. leisure, 
yeah. uh, any kind of uh, human and social activity. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know more about the G3 ICT. Please tell us in detail what it means and what does it do. Sure. That would be interesting. For well, me. back in 2006, when the convention was about to be uh, adopted by the United Nations uh, General Assembly, uh, persons close to UN, uh, the United Nations Department, Department of Economic and Social Affairs, mm -hmm. we are very much aware of the fact that the convention, uh, at least the draft of it at the time, uh, contained a lot of very innovative dispositions for information and communication technologies. Mm -hmm. And it became very apparent that uh, they were so, so numerous and so complex mm. that unless uh, we could push, you know, yeah. uh, to make people aware of those dispositions, mm. uh, including industry, governments, uh, uh, disabled person organizations, yeah. education, and so on and so forth. Uh, those dispositions may, may actually not be applied. So mm. uh, the UN wanted an advocacy initiative to be launched mm. uh, with multiple stakeholders. And so that's what, what we did. We launched that initiative back in December of six, uh, with industry, with uh, disabled person organizations, with government, uh, mm -hmm. international organizations, mm -hmm. to actually promote those digital accessibility agenda uh, components of the convention. Yeah. So that's what g does. It's a global initiative for mm -hmm. inclusive uh, information and commission technologies. Okay. Uh, one of the impor most important points in the session was the role of government. Yes. How can you think governments can put policies that address different aspects of accessibility? Well, first of all, uh, governments uh, in most cases have uh, a very keen interest in making sure that uh, disabled persons and, and also the elderly population mm -hmm. uh, actually benefits from, from an environment at large which allows them to have, you know, uh, as, as good a life as possible. Yeah. So uh, I do not find any country today that is not interested to discuss it, mm -hmm. really. Any mm -hmm. kind of uh, region and uh, situation, uh, you find government to be very interested by this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, governments have a lot of ways to actually influence ICT accessibility mm -hmm. and assistive technologies. First of all, uh, within governments, most of the time you have, like you have, for example, in Qatar with ICT Qatar, mm -hmm. an authority which controls telecommunications, broadcasting, and uh, technology in general. Mm -hmm. uh, that puts the government in a very strong position to influence a couple of things. So if you think about what's out there in the country, for example, yeah. uh, you know, you have a lot of cell phones. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of television. So just those two things, which are in direct, under the direct supervision of the regulator, yeah can be uh, tremendously improved for persons with disabilities. Mm. So for cell phones, it means accessible cell phones, which have you know, better ergonomic uh, features, mm -hmm. uh, text-to-speech, uh, voice recognition, mm. all kind of services embedded in the phone and so on, so forth, for persons with disabilities. Mm. For television, it means like you have an Al Jazeera uh, sign language in Arabic, mm -hmm. or you have uh, captioning for uh, different type of languages. Uh, and those things are extremely important because they are day-to-day -day devices which people use anyway, you know? Yeah. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, uh, cell phones can actually be used uh, mm. in ma many different innovative ways to actually uh, expand uh, the reach of assistive technologies to new yeah. populations. For example, uh, in Japan, uh, one of the major service providers offers uh, e-books on, on the phone. Mm -hmm. So they have like 17,000 Japanese books from mm -hmm. Japanese literature mm -hmm. which uh, can be actually listened to by persons with low vision or blind mm -hmm. okay. or persons with dyslexia or persons who actually are uh, you know, in, in, unable to read but yeah. can, can actually you know, listen to a book. Mm. Uh, so now think about the developing nations and how many cell phones there are out there mm. and how much uh, the schools mm -hmm. uh, could actually benefit from having those uh, type of uh, uh, digital book distribution. Mm. So it's, it's just an amazing, uh, an amazing potential. Yeah. Now, uh, to come back to your question on, on government policies, uh, there is also the potential to really influence uh, the accessibility of e-government services. Mm. Uh, right now, I see a lot of government committed to accessibility. Mm -hmm. However, their websites for their own government services aren't accessible. Yes. And of course, uh, that causes an issue because mm -hmm. if you launch new services on e-government websites, yeah. and those services are not only accessible to those persons who uh, you know, 
can actually yeah. read them, that's mm. a real problem. Mm. It's an ethical problem, it's a legal problem, it's, a, it's all kind of big issues. Yeah. So uh, making sure that within the government all websites are accessible is very important. I would say I would cite two countries which have actually done a great job at it. One is uh, Korea, which mm -hmm. has actually a very stringent uh, you know, government plan to mm -hmm. make sure that all websites are accessible. They have independent testing on all their websites mm. for central government and local mm. government, mm. and they report on it on a periodic fashion. Mm. So there is peer pressure among government agencies mm. to comply with the rule. Yeah. Another country which is uh, very interesting, which is Tunisia, mm. actually uh, made a decision uh, two years ago to have all their government websites accessible. In their case, they did not have the money to do it, so they applied for a grant from the uh, uh, World Bank to do it, okay. which, which they received. So that's another path, you know, yeah. then they, to hire uh, the proper means to uh, mm. address your accessibility. Yeah. Mm. Uh, ah. oh. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, so, yeah. So, so then one thing I wanted to mention is, which is really important, is an area of government where you can actually do a lot of good stuff is education. Because mm -hmm. when it comes to sophisticated assistive technologies, such mm -hmm. as you know, ways to uh, use a computer with your eye movement or your head movement, or with alternative input devices, mm -hmm. or text-to-speech, speech recognition a type of uh, input-output interfaces, yeah. it is very hard to use those technologies, assistive technologies, mm -hmm. without some training especially, for example, if you are blind from birth or mm. uh, you, know, you have not ever used a computer, yeah. uh, it is very hard. So it is possible, but it requires a lot of training mm. and support and mm. assistance to make it work. Yeah. And in m my short experience with that topic, talking to many different governments, I can see that those places where you have comprehensive school programs are the best way to get disabled persons from a young age to actually adjust to technology, mm. use assistive technologies, mm. and then uh, go to work with those same assistive technologies. Mm. We have one of our uh, partner organizations, which is uh, Politico di Milan, where they have done uh, such program for 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and among their graduate uh, engineers, mm -hmm. they have virtually no unemployment among the alumni, wow. among disabled alumni. Okay. And that is because they tailor solutions to them when they are at the school, at the mm. university. Mm -hmm. they, then, they then offer them to keep the package when they leave, mm. the hardware and software. Mm. And they offer one year of free support service to the first employer of the, mm. of the newly graduate students. Okay. And they go at least once a quarter to meet with the employer and the, and the former students mm. to check that everything is going smoothly in terms of integrating the technology mm. in the work environment. Mm. And the demonstration is there. Mm. When you do it effectively, mm. it works. Mm. So you take out people from unemployment to employment, from meaningless lives to very meaningful life, mm. from being a burden for society to being actually uh, a contributor yes. to society. Yeah. Just a quick statistics. In the United States, mm. which is you know a fairly uh, evolved nation mm. from an economic and social standpoint, mm. 70 percent, 70, 70 percent of blind persons, adult blind persons, mm. are unemployed. Mm. Mm. So, from all aspects, uh, and it's probably the same in most countries. Yeah. From all aspects that you can look at it, a human standpoint, a rights standpoint, and also an economic and the fiscal standpoint, yeah. uh, this is not an acceptable situation, yeah. especially when you know that solution exists to put those persons to work mm. with an appropriate set of support and, and contribution of technology. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested to know about the very interesting Japanese story, success story that you mentioned, which attracted the viewers and um, people's attention today. So yes. please tell us about it. It will interest our readers. Well, it's a story of a major manufacturer in Japan, we, uh, not manufacturer, but service provider, wireless service providers, mm -hmm. uh, actually the largest one in Japan. And they realized that the Japanese market being saturated, you know, it was very hard to grow their revenues. So they were looking at uh, specific demographics. They realized that uh, the more you go up into age brackets, mm. the least uh, people were likely to use a cell phone. So they started to study that very carefully. Mm. And they realized that they probably should actually rethink entirely the way they 
designed their phones and adopted universal design principles to redesign a new product line and a new mm -hmm. set of services and new set of distribution methods mm -hmm. for persons with disabilities and the elderly. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, uh, the result of that was that they introduced a, a new product line called the Raku Raku phone. Mm -hmm. And that uh, product line became so successful that uh, as of now, after a few years, mm. they have sold 15 million units of those phones. Mm. Uh, and they have gained 80% of the market share of elderly people in Japan. Mm. Um, also, one of the things you wanted to ask yourself today was which applications of assistive technology can benefit the most people with the least, cost, uh, with the least expense. And we know that cost can be a barrier to adopting technology. So please highlight on this also. Right. Well, there are a number of, uh, someone mentioned today that there are a lot of open source solutions which are quite good, you know, mm. so that's one avenue. Uh, you want to make sure when you uh, opt for an open source solution that it is sustainable long term, mm. that it will not disappear. Yeah. Uh, so it has, that's a question to be asked any time you choose an open source solution. Yeah. But I would say in general, um, open source solutions are going to be a component, a very important component of assistive technologies, mm. uh, you know. Uh, you have all kind of technologies today that are out there, you know, screen readers, you know, and yeah. uh, text-to-speech and all those kind of things you can mm -hmm. find for no, at no cost or very little cost. Mm -hmm. uh, now, from um, a more global standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, personally, um, I see standardization as the key to lowering the cost of technology. Mm -hmm. If you have standards implemented everywhere, okay. then you have mass production, mm. more competition, lowering of the cost, mm -hmm. and better prices for the, for the end user. Mm. So standards are extremely important. One industry that has been highly standardized, which could easily adopt new standards for accessibility, mm -hmm. is the uh, wireless phones industry. Okay. Because uh, it is the largest install base of any ICC device in the world with over 4 billion units mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So it's two human beings out of six of four, uh, mm. sorry, of three. Of, yeah. yeah, two out of three human yeah. beings have a cell phone, essentially. Yeah. Uh, they are wi very widespread in developing nations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the technology exists today to make those cell phones tremendously helpful uh, platform for uh, assistive mm. technologies. Yeah. You can today with a cell phone speak to your cell phone and take notes, mm. send messages that you speak. Yeah. Right? You can listen to through text to speech technology to messages you receive or mm -hmm. documents you retrieve. Mm -hmm. You can read a book aloud with uh, you know, the light DAISY browser on yeah. your cell phone. Uh, some cell phones come with a scanner at the bottom of the cell phone, mm -hmm. which allows you to you know, sw swipe the phone on the text mm. and hear the text on your phone. Mm. Uh, you can actually have a GPS positioning system on your phone mm. or a triangulation system that allows you to know exactly where you are. Mm. And for certain type of uh, impairments, mm. it's extremely important. Yeah. You also have phones with very uh, good ergonomic uh, features, mm. big keyboards, big screen, mm. adjusted contrast, yeah. all kind of stuff that are really barriers today if they're not implemented. Mm. Um, I think the cell phone also is becoming closer and closer to the small notebook. Mm. So uh, you can see now some cell phone manufacturers getting into the notebook business and notebook manufacturers, you know, getting involved yeah. into uh, cell phone-like phone. services. Yeah. So that's a small thing in the, of the future, whatever is the name, a PDA, a cell phone, or a notebook, mm. an evolved notebook, is going to be a tremendous platform for disabled person. Mm. And standardization of equipment, of software, operating system and software, mm. and application programming interfaces mm. uh, for person with disabilities mm. is uh, the key to success. And I think it's it's going to happen. Okay. It is yeah. going to happen. That's my belief. Final question. Uh, I know it took a lot of your time. Uh, yeah. Was the uh, announcement of Mr. Samuel Bashir from ITUD uh, about the accessibility uh, toolkit? So I'd like to know more about that. Correct. So what we did there with the ITU, we decided to go ahead and uh, do a joint effort to assemble on a single website mm -hmm. every single possible reference that could be helpful to policymakers dealing with ICT accessibility. Okay. So from uh, legal analysis of the convention, mm -hmm. uh, method to evaluate your uh, population of disabled persons and what type of uh, you know, impairments are most prevalent, 
to defining uh, basics of accessibility, mm -hmm. and then to looking at every single category of technology and look at what were the existing uh, technologies that can be used, the standards, mm. case studies, example of legislation regulation in each of those categories, yeah. uh, as well as um, uh, covering product development issues, assistive technologies uh, strategies, uh, international cooperation strategies, mm -hmm. specific areas of local government application, mm -hmm. and then finally uh, uh, focus on how to actually uh, develop policy at the national level. Mm -hmm. So that toolkit uh, is going to be uh, an online resource for all policymakers. We hope that actually everyone who uses it will contribute to it as well. So we are mm -hmm. starting to get case studies that will over time enrich the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to develop, I hope, a new community of experts, mm. policy makers and their constituents that are implementing those uh, very complex rules and mm. uh, programs, you know. Mm. Uh, and so uh, we hope to be the nucleus of that uh, kind of global team mm. that's at it, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for this lovely interview and all, you, all these insights. I appreciate that very much. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much and congratulations uh, to ICT Qatar for your various initiatives. It's terrific to see what the type of focus you have there. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.